Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, during today's webinar, we are going to talk about implementing international standards in Europe, and more in particular, of course, about the Frankfurt Agreement. You are all muted during the presentation, so you're not even able to uh, raise your questions out loud, but please use the Q&A panel to submit your questions. Um, afterwards, the speakers will have a look at your questions and try to reply as many as possible. Should your question remain unreplied during today's webinar, uh, please uh, note that we will make a Q&A report available afterwards that we will share with you. This webinar has been recorded, so you will receive later today the recording in your inbox together with the presentation, the complete set of slides. So without further ado, I would like to um, tell you that I'm sitting together in the same room today in Brussels with uh, the four speakers that you see on the slide. So we have the pleasure today to have with us Mr. Gilles Tonnet, Deputy Secretary General, SMB Secretary at the IEC, and my colleagues, Cynthia, Catherine, and Wuxin are together with me as well. So without adding any other details, I would go, like to go to the outline of today's webinar. We are, of course, like I said, having um, a presentation about the Frankfurt Agreement. Um, the presenters will talk about the many be benefits that the IEC and Semelec relationship has. Um, how do IEC and Semelec work together in practice will be covered as well. Uh, and then uh, it's about the European standardization system and the EU legislation in detail. And we end up with some specific European elements of the agreement. So let's continue with the first slide, the overview of the Frankfurt Agreement. Since yes. please, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Els. And put on the camera also myself. Good afternoon, everyone. And we cannot talk about the uh, Frankfurt Agreement without uh, saying a few words about uh, uh, Sanalek. And so who is the Sanalek? Uh, Sanalek is one of the three European standardization organization as officially recognized by um, a European uh, legislation that is a regulation 1025 2012 recently amended by a new regulation um, of 2480 or 2022 um, that is really reinforcing the role of the uh, three ESOs and of their uh, national committees. And this piece is a piece of legislation really entrusts the three organization, and in this case, uh, Senelec for the development of European standards uh, in support of the internal market. Senelec is a membership-based organization, and uh, we have 34 national committees, and uh, it's uh, important to uh, stress also in the frame of this webinar that all 34 members of Senelec are also IEC uh, members. And the reasons behind this agreement that we will explain also more in details uh, afterwards is uh, related to the fact that while Senelec develops standards to support the internal market, uh, uh, Senelec is also committed to their uh, its engagement towards having a uh, one single solution at international level, and to work as much as possible together with uh, with IEC um, at and do the work uh, at IEC level. And whenever we have the opportunity, the possibility, we of course um, implement those standards at a European level and the strength of, uh, of Senelec is then once we publish one standards at European level, we have to obligate, our members have the obligation to withdraw all conflicting national standards and hence one single solution is applied across 34 members. Of course, we will go much more into details in the practice in the next few slides. And whenever we do so in Senelec, of course, the standards are published as ENIC standard. But uh, um, yes, let's go a bit more in the, in the Frankfurt Agreement. The Frankfurt Agreement is the last one of a series of agreements that we have uh, um, signed with, uh, with IEC. 
as you see here, is a really long-standing partnership for, and we have been having that for more than 30 years. And this has resulted in uh, an alignment uh, of our publication of a very of a very high percentage, and 80% of our documents are really identical or based on IC uh, documents. And as you see here, we started in 91, and then we had the Dresden Agreement in 96, and recently we had the agreement reviewed and reinforced thanks to the Frankfurt Agreement in 2016 that we are presenting more in detail here today. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Cinzia. Let me uh, take over. Hello, everyone. Um, just to tell you a little bit uh, of background about the Frankfurt Agreement, the purpose, objectives, and the scope. Um, well, as you all know, international standardization serves or try really to force the global trade. So um, in accordance with the World Trade Organization principle, uh, the Frankfurt Agreement really recognized the primacy of international standardization over regional or national standardization as well. That's a very important principle. It's really one of the main I would say anchor of, of this agreement. And it also helps to harmonize standards with also technical regulations across the world to reduce also the technical barriers to trade, which is one of the major uh, objective of the World Trade Organization. Now, let's look a little bit more in detail at the uh, objectives of the Frankfurt Agreement. I would single out three main objectives. The first one, as we said already, is to, to really recognize and also commit to primarily undertake the work at the IC level, whenever it's possible, uh, of course, and then adopt as much as possible IC standards uh, in, in Europe. But it's also about uh, an optimization uh, of resources. We try to avoid the duplication of work. So as we all know, we have limited resources to work on standardization. So it's really important to make the best use of our resources. So avoiding any duplication, any overlap is of course a major objective of the Frankfurt Agreement. And then finally, also making sure that we are in line with the market expectations, both at the international, but also at the European level. While we try to be as much aligned as possible at the international and European level, we also have to recognize that sometimes there are some specific requirements or specific needs at the European level, and the Frankfurt Agreement provide a framework also to take care of those uh, needs. So now, in practice, if we look at the, the scope of the, the Frankfurt Agreement on the next slide, um, you will uh, notice that the agreement only applies to standards, doesn't apply to other types of deliverables. So for instance, if uh, technical committees on both sides, IEC or Senelec side would like to adopt other types of deliverables like technical reports or technical specifications, this is done on a case by case basis. For instance, on the Senelec side, uh, they will need uh, agreement from the technical board uh, on, the, on the IEC side. This is decided by the committee themselves. And we will, of course, uh, uh, ask permission to uh, to the Sense and Elect Management Center. Also, with regard to JTC1, which is an important joint committee between ISO and IEC, the work of JTC1 has been permanently exempted from parallel development. And we will explain a little bit later on what we mean by parallel development. Historically speaking, there was uh, the notion that IT work would be kind of or IT deliverable would be the same, you know, worldwide, and that this wouldn't really fit, uh, let's say, the, the Frankfurt Agreement. However, in some specific cases, JTC1 standard can still be adopted by SEN or SENELEC under the mode five of cooperation. But again, this is done on a very ad hoc basis. So this is about the scope of the Frankfurt Agreement. Now, we suggest to move to the benefits of this uh, cooperation. So perhaps, Chinsia, you can start a little bit from the Senelec perspective. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Gilles. Uh, thank you very much for this. And uh, maybe we can, uh, well, 
Exactly. Go to the added value of Sanalec 2 IEC. As I was mentioning before, uh, well, in, uh, in Europe, we have a particular system whereby we once uh, in Sanalec, we adopt uh, a standard. Uh, these uh, become what we call a European standards, and our members have the obligation to implement it as uh, national standards and withdraw all conflicting uh, conflicting national standard. As you will, as you understand, this is a, a key tool for the single market and not only for uh, European companies, but also for international one to use this solution to enter the uh, the single the European single market. And this is even more so when those standards are cited in the official journal of the European Union and provide presumption of conformity to uh, the, the European legislation. And uh, my colleagues later on will give a bit more details on how these uh, actually uh, act. Now, uh, if we look at the figures um, to give you a little bit of a flavor of you know what it means to uh, to have this agreement in place, and what it means also in terms of or from the perspective of IEC standards. Um, you will see the figures really speak by themselves. That we have quite a, of a strong alignment between the two organizations. More than seventy five percent of IEC standards follow the parallel Senelec procedure or adoption, and we will explain in a moment what we mean by a parallel procedure, which means that roughly 80% of IC standards are adopted as Senelec standards. This is a very high figure reflecting really the very strong relationship link we have between the IC and Senelec. So at the end of the day, more than 80% of Senelec standards are identical to or based or derived from IC standards. And then, we will uh, present you, we will explain you what uh, harmonized or European harmonized standards are, but I can give you already the figure that 30% of Senelec standards are officially harmonized or European harmonized standards. And 75% of which are again identical or based on IC standards. So you can really see the very strong alignment between the two organization and also in terms of the deliverables a lot, a really large majority of Senelec standards are either identical or derived from IC standards. So now we're going to move to uh, the more technicalities and our colleagues uh, Catherine from Senelec will explain you a little bit more practically speaking how IC and Senelec work together. Thank you, Gilles. So yes, indeed, uh, let's go a little bit more into details into the Frankfurt Agreement as such. So the agreement is um, articulated around four main provisions that you see on the screen, which is the common planning of work, parallel voting of draft international standards, publication requirements, and the conversion of European standards into international standards. So let's now dig into the first pillar, which is the common planning of work. So um, when there is a new work item initiated at IEC level, the Senelec Management Center is informed and assigned this work to a mirroring Senelec Technical Committee. The work item, of course, is registered in the Senelec database and is added to the program, to the work program of the concerned technical committee. Feedback, of course, is given to IEC regarding specific regional information meaning, for instance, a legislative aspect on the European side that IEC needs to be aware of. And then the parallel adoption starts. I'll come back on that later. In some cases, um, IEC projects are exempted from parallel procedure, and this exemption can be temporary or permanent. And in those cases, of course, there is no adoption as such, but a national uh, adoption is still possible by uh, Senelec members. When the work is initiated in Senelec, because we, of course, in Senelec, we can also have like um, what we call homegrown standards, so purely European work, the Senelec Technical Committee has to ensure first 
before even initiating the pros project that there is no overlapping IEC work on the topic and also has to assess uh, whether its corresponding IEC technical committee would initiate or not such a work in a more timely manner to meet the European needs. If this is not the case, the Senelec new work item is approved by the Senelec technical board, which is which can be compared to the IEC uh, standardization management board for those who are not yet familiar with Senelec. And the uh, Senelec management center informed the IEC central office on the creation of this new work item. And at the same time, the Senelec technical committee can start working on the project. Should there be an interest from the IEC technical committee, the IEC committee starts the new work item process and the Sensory Management Center is informed of the outcome of this IEC new work item process. If the proposal is accepted at the IEC level, the work continues at, nas at international level. Therefore, the European work item is abandoned and the new work item will be created for parallel work at the uh, European level. And this based, of course, on the IEC uh, notification we receive. If the proposal is not accepted, at IC, the work continues at European level only. Um, it is to be noted that a, a select technical, um, that the select technical board can decide that a new work item is not to be offered to IC, and this for specific reason and justified reason. For example, uh, the new work item is covering purely European aspect, or the new work item is in fact the adoption of a published IC standard. Then. Um, there is no need to offer, of course, the work item. Let's now focus on the second pillar of the um, Frankfurt Agreement, which is the parallel adoption uh, process. So the basic principle is that Senelec and IEC members vote on the same text synchronously. In other words, all CDV and FDs, huh, which are the, the, the draft at IEC level, uh, circulated for vote at IEC are automatically submitted for inquiry and vote respectively within Senelec. Of course, Senelec is dependent on information from IEC for the management of the Senelec work program, and of course, the IEC rules are followed. It may happen that a Senelec technical committee realized during the development process that some European adjustments are needed to, um, to the document. There is the possibility for the Senelec Technical Committee to develop what we call in our jargon, common modifications. In fact, common modifications, in other words, are European pages. If the Senelec Technical Committee, who is of course responsible for those common modifications, uh, provide these modifications to the Senelec Management Center on time, common modifications are um, we try to ensure that the common modifications are voted at the same time as the CDV and the FDs. Just to let you know that these common modifications will not be merged uh, into one document, but will remain a separate document and what will be called Amendment 11 in our jargon. But this is a little bit uh, too much into details, but of course we are available to give you more details if you wish. Um, more than 80%, as Jill, as Jill has said, of select standards are identical or based uh, on IEC standards. And the question might be, yeah, but why not 100%? As said earlier, it's because there are some European specificities in some sectors which, in which purely European standards are developed or topics outside the interest of select members. And as said, on a justified basis, a technical committee uh, and on the basis on the approval of the board, of technical board, can request exemption from parallel procedure. And I said this exemption can be temporary or permanent. Uh, for instance, uh, standards uh, with databases or standards refer to international legislations are exempted as such in Europe. The third provision of the uh, Frankfurt Agreement, because we are already at the third, uh, um, third pillar, is uh, concerns the referencing of ENs. Um, the ISO IEC Guide 21, which is called the Regional or National Adoption of International Standards and Other Deliverables, Part 1, Adoption of International Standards, the title is a bit long, but applies for Senelec. So Senelec standards identical to IEC 
publications are named ENIC 60XXX something. In other words, it has the same series number as the entitled, as the IEC standard, but just with an EN before in the reference. You might be interested to know that purely European standards, their, their series start with a 50 number, and of course, it does not have IEC in the reference. So a purely European standard will be EN 50, and uh, a standard uh, under the Frankfurt Agreement will be EN IEC 60 something. Let's now focus on the fourth and last pillar of the Frankfurt Agreement, which is the conversion of European standards into international standards. So all select standards of, of uh, European origin, so what we call, again in our jargon, homegrown standards, so the EN50 series, are offered to IEC central office by the Sensei Management Center for possible conversion into an IEC standard if there is an interest. So um, the IC Central Office, when receiving those uh, European uh, standards, submit this to the relevant IEC Technical Committee for consideration and decision. If the IEC Technical Committee decides to take the work on board, and if the text is identical, uh, a, new a new proposal or a fast track process init is initiated at IEC level. This process can trigger what we use to call uh, the so-called boomerang procedure, but this is very uh, rare case. Uh, and what will happen is that for work taken up identically by IEC, uh, we will align the uh, existing Senec reference by the IEC reference. If the text is different, which is the majority of the case, the Senec Technical Committee uh, inform the management center on an adoption procedure, meaning that the tech Senate technical committee will start in fact a parallel procedure on this one. I'm now giving the floor to Nushin, who will give you more info uh, on the link with the European standardization system and in the Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, hello and good afternoon. So in this part of the presentation, I will speak about the European standardization system and how it can uh, support the European legislations and what are the relation here and what are the opportunities with regards to uh, the Frankfurt Agreement. So as you know, in Europe, we have the European legislations. They are set by uh, the public authorities, proposed, drafted and uh, adopted by European Commission, European Parliament and Council of the European Union. Uh, these legislations, they define uh, the essential requirements which are mandatory for the products to comply to in order to be able to be placed in the market. So these, um, these requirements, essential requirements are mandatory. However, under the new legislative framework that's already set uh, more than a decade or even longer, um, there is no... Um, just the goals are set, but the, the freedom is given to the manufacturer or any other uh, economic operator to choose how to uh, demonstrate they comply with this, and they provide basically um, uh, conformity to these uh, requirements. So one of the ways to show, um, to, to show the compliance to the uh, essential requirements is to use a so-called harmonized standards. And this would be the uh, main topic that I will explain in this, in this part of the presentation. Of course, the manufacturer can uh, choose different uh, ways, uh, different technical solutions. However, um, this could include uh, also a procedure to demonstrate that they, the product is complying with the requirements uh, of the legislations, and uh, it can often include the third party uh, conformity assessment bodies. So coming back to the European harmonized European standards. So these standards can be developed only as it was mentioned earlier by the recognized European standardization organization, Tencent and Etsy. And uh, via a special request, a standard request um, issued for Senate and Elec to develop this harmonized standard. Of course, as any other standards, these standards are voluntary. So it's just one of the means for the manufacturers to show that their products comply with the European legislations. 
And um, uh, at the European level, you also know that we have the uh, C marking and when the harmonized standards come, uh, they will have a special feature here because with the harmonized standards, the manufacturer can also benefit from the presumption of conformity and it becomes a kind of uh, cost effective and facilitator for the manufacturers to uh, reach to uh, presumption of conformity, conformity and uh, uh, C marking. Okay. The next slide. Thank you. So uh, now a little bit more explanation on this in this regard. So on the left side up, I will start from there. Um, the European uh, every year, um, the European Commission makes available a so-called annual evening work program that sets the topics that are the priority for the European standardization. And um, following that, there are the standardizations the European Commission can issue standardization request to one, two, or three uh, European standardization bodies, uh, European organizations, sorry, and uh, request what is needed, what standards are needed to support that legislation. Of course, this is for the consideration of Sen and Senelec in this case. Um, uh, uh, as it was discussed before under the Frankfurt Agreement and Vienna Agreement, we always check if there's already a deliverable being developed or existing already at IC level that can uh, fit into the this standardization request. And, um, and we also align this with, uh, with our um, work program of Senelec. And uh, the work will be allocated to one or multiple technical committees to start developing the standards. So this is the procedure, basically how the harmonized standards are being developed. And um, before, before there is one uh, intermediate, let's say, step additionally here, and that's the assessment procedure. So for these category of the standards that they are requested via standardization request, there is also an additional step. Uh, I will come back to this uh, in the next slide, but uh, we have the uh, procedure to check if the standards, they comply already during the drafting with the requirements from the, uh, that legislation. And that is done by the HAS consultants that I will explain a bit in a, in a bit. And uh, once the standard is developed, uh, they will be uh, made available to the Commission and they can be um, cited in the official journal of the European Union. And the manufacturer can use them uh, and benefit from the presumption of the conformity. We can go to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, the, I mentioned earlier about the house consultants. So who are house consultants and what is their um, responsibility? Has consultants are independent experts contracted by the Commission. Um, it can be by a general uh, consulting, for example, like Ernest and Young, and they assess the compliance of the documents drafted by the uh, European Standardization Organization against the legislative requirements to ensure that these draft standards already uh, comply with uh, safety objectives or the essential requirements. The HAS consultant is helping the technical committees. They are interfaced to help both the commission and also the technical committee who is drafting the standard to, make, to ensure and to, um, to ensure that their documents is on the, on the right track, basically. The HAS consultants comments. There's a no veto on the consensus, so the comments are for consideration. And um, and there is an input for the compliance of the new legislation, as I mentioned, on the harmonized standard. So these are the main two. Um, so it happens, we already mentioned, touched upon this uh, quickly before, uh, my colleague Catherine talked about it, that sometimes uh, there could be that uh, we have um, additional requirements in order to comply with what is existing in Europe. Um, we, when there is no uh, possibility of the alignment with the document at IC, we might need to uh, create a so-called uh, an amendment, European amendment or common modification. So of course, when the comments are available by the House consultant and there is a need um, for some technical modifications, uh, of course, these uh, would be always presented first uh, added to the IEC technical committees and they are free to decide whether to pick their comments, include them in the documents or not. But 
Of course, this would be an opportunity to maximize the number of harmonized ENIEC standards without creating a European common modification. There is now, um, let's have an overview of, this is an overview of the harmonization procedure. How do we develop the harmonized standards? So basically developing a harmonized standard is like any other standard under the Frankfurt Agreement. As you can see on the very left side, we have both Center Lake and IEC. The, uh, at the CDs, and you will see one additional feature here and that uh, um, assessment. We have received four times the assessment throughout the uh, lifetime of this project. And um, the first assessment is basically happening at the early stage. It can happen at CD stage already. Uh, it's important, of course, that uh, the involvement of the consultants be as early as possible. And of course, if the document is um, in a good shape, it has a good quality, then uh, the input from the consultants can be uh, more effective and the document uh, procedure to develop the document, um, it will be much more smoother. So if a compliant is not achieved at the early stage, we have also the possibility to ask for um, other HAS assessment, uh, which will happen at uh, different stages, at inquiry stage, sorry, at CDB stage, inquiry stage, and at FP stage. And there is one last um, HAS assessment that can be asked in case the pass assessment is not positive at the FPs and at the last compliance assessment. So basically, um, the HAS assessment can be asked four times throughout the life if it's needed. And um, once we have the compliance, the standard will be published and offered to the Commission for the citation in the official journal of the European Union. Now, there are several typical European elements um, when we talk about the harmonized standards. We mentioned earlier about the, about the common modifications. I, um, I also mentioned it that if there is no possibility of the alignment with the specific European needs, then at Senelec we create a common modification. So those um, basically requirements are mentioned in the current modifications and we always offer these uh, modifications for the IEC for later uptake. There, are, uh, there is another element uh, in addition to the IEC document when we talk about the um, ENICs and that's the Annex of Day. It's um, a normative document. It's basically a table that shows the relation, that shows uh, the normative reference of the IEC standard and in front of it, the equivalent, their equivalent European normative references. Also mandatory for harmonized standards that are developed in response to a standardization request is that to include an annex Z. What is the annex Z? It's an informative table that it shows that um, which part of the standard, which clause of the standards is covering uh, which essential requirements or uh, safety objectives of uh, a directive or a legislation. So the Annex ZZ are mandatory for all harmonized standards. And the Annex ZZ and Annex ZA would be the two additional elements to the IEC document when we talk about the harmonized standards. And I think uh, this might be my last slide. And I will pass that to Gilles and Chintia for the yeah. conclusion. Thank you very much, uh, Nushin and uh, Catherine, to explain a little bit the technicalities. Uh, of course, this is, um, you know, kind of a high level um, overview of how, you know, the relations and uh, the, the, the working methods between IEC and Senelec work. We have seen, uh, of course, in the chat or in the Q&A that there are, you know, many questions. We will already take a few of them today. Um, now, if we look at the main takeaways, uh, I think what we, we also try to explain to our community here is that, you know, the relation between IC and Senelec formalized by the Frankfurt Agreement is a win-win situation. Of course, from an IC perspective, we treat all countries the same way. One country, one vote. We don't give preference to one region over the other one. In this case, however, this partnership really benefit to the whole IC community, not only to the manufacturers 
based in Europe or the European manufacturers, for instance, but also for the non-European ones willing to get access to the European market, they can really benefit from the single market and from the Frankfurt uh, agreement. So from our perspective, from the IC perspective, this is really a win-win situation. And that's why we put a lot of importance uh, to the, the Frankfurt agreement. And this is reflected also in the strong alignment, about 80%, as we said, um, between the, the standards on both sides. So perhaps, Chinsia, you can offer some final thoughts from, from your perspective as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gilles. And as a matter of fact, uh, the 80%, the as you clearly indicated, really express the huge commitment for, from the Senelec community to have one single solution whenever possible. That's why it's crucial for us to really closely monitor and follow what is happening at international uh, at international level. And that's why we offered as many project that we also initiate in Europe at international level so that it can be done first at IEC level. And, uh, and as you know, and we have explained uh, during the, the meet, uh, this uh, webinar, a huge uh, importance we give to the possibility to have uh, also what we call the harmonized European standards develop in parallel uh, with, uh, with IEC. As Gilles was mentioning, this is a very good, excellent tool that, that give access to uh, the European, uh, European single market. And uh, in order to make sure that we align as much as possible, we have uh, regular exchange, regular coordination meeting, uh, uh, at management level, but also at more operational level to smoothen uh, all the proceedings related to uh, the Frankfurt Agreement. As a matter of fact, this morning we had uh, a meeting here in Brussels uh, in order to address uh, some of those uh, of those aspects. And we hope that uh, we the, the, the live to facilitate also even more in future uh, the life of our experts and of our technical uh, committees. These were, I think, the main aspects that we wanted to, to cover today. Uh, from the Senelec point of view, we are very pleased of the collaboration and the, the way that the Frankfurt Agreement is uh, is actually working. It doesn't mean that there are room for improvement. There will certainly are, but I think that we have an excellent basis for, uh, for collaboration. And all those that have participated to this uh, webinar, but also for all the interested, we have a set of uh, uh, documents that, uh, that are available. And uh, you see here, we have all the links where you can find all uh, relevant uh, information. And I think that uh, with this, uh, we'll finish the first part of this uh, webinar with us, speaking and uh, making this uh, this presentation uh, but we are uh, we still have some time to address some question i believe uh, else uh, and uh, those that of course we managed to respond live uh, some of some asked questions uh, i believe we we already addressed uh, while other speakers were uh, intervening. Some will do it now live and others most probably will uh, answer in written after this, uh, after this uh, webinar. But maybe else you want to add uh, anything to this? Uh, yes, thank you, Cynthia. And uh, of course, thank you, Jean, Lucien and Catherine as well. I just would like to launch a feedback poll while we maybe have a look at the questions in the background. Um, the feedback poll is asking just uh, three short questions to the attendees and asking them how they uh, live this webinar and we will use the replies to improve our webinars in the future. So while the attendees are doing this, uh, bear with us for a moment so that we have a look at the questions and we can address some of them. As promised at the beginning of this webinar, we do not intend to reply all the questions. You are many to follow us today. so. Um, we promise to make a Q&A report available via uh, the websites that will be shared with you later on. So thank you. Okay, there is one question from Thomas. Uh, he would like to know what are the main differences between the Frankfurt and the Vienna Agreement, that is the agreement that ISO has with SEN, and if there is the intention to harmonize both agreements in the future. 
Well, uh, thank you, Thomas, for the question. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, um, both are really uh, agreement on technical cooperation. Both agreements really foreseen the primacy of international standards that have been developed really because of the commitment, as I we mentioned before, of Senelec and SEN to conform and to the respect and to develop as much as possible standard in alignment with the, with ISO and IEC. Now, the way this, that the agreement has been developed and the content of the agreement, as you most probably know, are not uh, is not the same. Uh, the way the agreement are applied is not necessarily the same, also because of the different and the specificities of the sectors that are covered uh, uh, by the two by the two agreements. Uh, and uh, and and the needs uh, because ultimately the the agreements re reflect the needs of the of the sectors covered by the two uh, the two organization we go much more systematically at international level with uh, the frankfurt agreement is not necessarily the case uh, in uh, for the uh, projects under the the vienna uh, the vienna agreement there has no been any discussion in alignment the two, in aligning the two the two agreements. The organization remain all independent organization. SEN and SEN like are two independent organization, as are uh, ISO uh, and IC. Um, and hence, uh, what we are currently doing is really to address and reflect in as I was mentioning before in those agreements the need of the on the stakeholders. Thank you, Cynthia. That was clear, I think. Uh, there is another question, or maybe more a statement of Timo. He says that it seems obvious that less and less IEC standards are adopted as harmonized European standards due to many reasons, including uh, a European slow panel process and assessment delays. Uh, he wants to know what is Semelec's response to this scenario. Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you're right. The last couple of years has been particularly challenging for the adoption of uh, international standards, har harmonized European uh, standards. Um, we have been discussing here uh, about the, the challenges that we have been, uh, that have been facing that has led to uh, the uh, non-publication of more than uh, 100 uh, international standards, European standards due as you very well uh, put it out uh, or during uh, due also to the assessment process the intervention of the uh, famous has uh, consultant and uh, i would like to reassure you that on the senelec side uh, we have been taking a series of measures uh, together also with the european commission to address the the bumping road that has been the the development of harmonized european standards to make sure that ultimately not only the Euro purely european but also the those standards developed uh, with the uh, uh, iec are uh, in conformity with the european legislation and again to tell you something, yesterday we had a very good meeting with the European Commission, IEC representatives to, to discuss how we can facilitate this, uh, this process. And indeed, you will learn, we are putting a few operational elements into, into place and you will learn more in the next few months on how this will all play out. And maybe Gilles wants to say a few words about it. No, sure. Well. And uh, I can add that from a, let's say from an SM, uh, from an IC perspective uh, as well, we we take also those concerns very seriously. We know there's uh, there's a legal and regulatory framework in, in Europe uh, with the European Commission playing uh, let's say the driving role here. We are very well aware that uh, there has been a number of concerns or pain points also with the Haas consultant. This has been also discussed within the IC, within the SMB, by both European and non-European uh, experts from different committees. So um, we have been part of the discussion of the group together with Senelec, with ISO, because ISO is also in a similar situation, discussing with the European Commission how we can improve the system. Of course, there are things we cannot change. There are some legal constraints, but there are a number of operational uh, issues that we've been working on 
and we had indeed over the last day also some uh, very successful meetings where we hope we can smooth a little bit the system and make the life of our committees uh, easier for the benefits of everyone. So again, this um, has been also on the agenda of the SMB for the last almost two years, I would say. And the, the next uh, SMB meeting uh, in October in Egypt, we will rediscuss this and we'll be very pleased to have also Chinsia providing an update to the IC community. Thank you, Gilles. <clears throat> Thank you, Cynthia. There is another question uh, that popped up um, in reference to slide 22. If I'm not mistaken, that was presenting the European standardization system and its link to European legislation. And Mike wants to know where fits Etsy into this uh, slide. Well, uh, while uh, uh, IT is a uh, different uh, structure than uh, SAN and Senelec, uh, uh, as you might be uh, very well aware, the way that the European Commission requests uh, the three organizations to develop standards in support of the European legislation is the same. So through uh, a standardization request, and uh, it, the, the Commission direct this request to one of the three organizations or two of the three or the three of them all together, uh, depending on the, the scope of the work to be to be carried out. We have areas where Sun and Sunlight work together, other where Sun and Etsy work together, some other where Etsy work alone or Sun or Sunlight work alone. So it really depend on the scope of activity, but the process for the requesting and supporting the, the European legislation is the same. And so I, we also included the third the European organization in the, in the picture. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question in our list is about the HAS consultant. Um, uh, Andreas wants to know if the HAS consultant has the right to directly address IEC technical committee. Well, actually, <clears throat> And this is something that we have discussed uh, also yesterday with the, with the European Commission uh, uh, representatives. And uh, as a matter of fact, they also have confirmed that the uh, the house consultant have uh, some budget also for traveling uh, outside Europe and to contribute and participating to the uh, IECTC if there is a need and uh, if they are welcome to do so, they are they, are, they would be allowed to join uh, join meetings or to in any case contribute to the discussion if that would facilitate uh, the process. So yes, the answer is basically yes. <laughs> okay, thank you, Cynthia. Excellent. Um, Gilles, can I ask you to have a look at a question from Jacques Levet? Uh, he's wondering if it's planned to extend the Frankfurt Agreement to the Joint Technical Committee wide standards. Yes, I uh, I spoke about JTC1. So JTC1 is not part of the Frankfurt Agreement today. So it's exempted from this uh, parallel procedure. There has been just a few cases where uh, an ad hoc adoption of a JTC1 standards has been done at the European level. At this stage, there is no plan to put back, let's say, JTC1 in the Frankfurt Agreement. Now, in the future, if we look at, um, let's say, a future agreement, because if one day the Frankfurt Agreement gets updated uh, or revised, uh, and I don't know yet how it will be called, um, this could be an option that we will, uh, we will look at. Also, it's also no secret that there may also on the, at the international level be some other JTCs, and this is no, no secret that we both IEC and ISO members have just approved also the um, establishment of a new JTC on quantum technologies, which will materialize next year. So this is something that could be, that will certainly be discussed in the future, but at this stage, uh, no, uh, there's no plan uh, to integrate uh, JTC1 in the Frankfurt uh, Agreement. Okay, thank you, Jill. Um, Cynthia, would you mind having a look at the question from Peter? Mm -hmm. um, he's wondering if there is a possibility to get any input from Has consultants, consultants, sorry, to IC standardization at an earlier stage than after the FDs, in order to be more proactive and increase the possibility of getting the EN standard harmonized. 
Yes, uh, yes, uh, sure. And I saw that there are a, there were a few questions that more or less uh, went uh, in in the same line. And uh, in this, yes, uh, there is this uh, possibility. And as a matter of fact, uh, we some of the solutions that we are uh, trying to put uh, together is indeed for. Uh, uh, to get an assessment of the house consultant already at the CD stage. So that would really help uh, the technical committees to consider the elements and uh, include it in the, in the assessment of the consultant as early as possible in the, in the process. Because indeed we realize that having it at FDs is very much uh, very late and this uh, also result in the decoupling of the work from uh, uh, European and international stage. So yes, this is something that we have been discussing with IC, we have been discussing with the, with the Commission in order to have really an involvement of the consultant as early as possible in, uh, in the process. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. Uh, we're still having a look at your questions for the moment, but you're many to uh, post questions, so please bear with us for a little while. In case you did not answer our feedback poll yet, please be feel, feel free to do so. We, uh, uh, we highly uh, recommend you to do so, and we appreciate, of course, your feedback to improve our webinars in the future. Catherine. Yes, as I noticed that there are um, some questions from colleagues online um, regarding the fact that there might not be a, a select technical committee mirroring all the IEC uh, technical committees. Indeed, we do not have for all IEC committees a select technical committees, but for all those for which we don't have um, a select technical committee, we do have what we call a reporting secretariat and the secretariat of which is led by one of a SENLEC member, who is responsible to follow the work of this IEC technical committee. Should there be a need to develop, I don't know, specific European pages, um, but this is our cases, to be honest, um, this reporting secretariat can still consider the possibility either to uh, become uh, a temporary group, or even to transform itself in a technical committee if there is such request or such need from a member. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Catherine. That's clear. Jim, please, yes. Um, yeah, I can take one. There was a question about um, whether a similar agreement could be extended to other regions uh, as well. Um, so for the moment, it's true that the Frankfurt Agreement is unique between IEC and Senelec. But it is also unique because of the European configuration, because of there is a single market, there's a single regulatory framework, there's a single legal framework also. And that makes also the Frankfurt uh, Agreement uh, very unique. From an IC perspective, of course, we welcome the participation of all countries, all members. Now, of course, if in the future other region were to develop you know, a similar market structure as the European one, that could be something also to be considered. But I, I, I really want to point out that the Frankfurt Agreement also reflects also the, the singularity and the particularity of the European market. But again, from an IC perspective, we believe it's a win-win situation. But for us, we treat all regions, all countries the same way. And we really welcome input from my group. Thank you. Yeah, Cynthia, please. Uh, yes, uh, um, maybe some uh, a general a general comment. We know that there have been because we have seen also many questions around that that there have been um, uh, uh, some issues with the harmonization of international standards that we were mentioning also earlier, and we are also very much aware that this uh, presentation uh, um, is was mainly. Um, the purpose of this presentation was really to give uh, the framework of the way uh, uh, Sanadec and IEC are working, the basis of the, of the Frankfurt Agreement, but please bear with us but because there will be also more dedicated trainings and webinars in relation to the 
harmonize standards and how we work together even more so uh, in a stronger way in in future in order to to make sure that the standards are, are aligned so there will be also dedicating training for harmonized standards that was my main message <laughs> okay thank you Cynthia um there is one question of Thomas working in some like DC 21x on European standards in response to standardization requests on batteries. Uh, they were told that there will be harmonized standards, but the harmonization process will be taken care of by the commission directly um, through the desk officer at the commission, whereby the health consultant is passed by. Is there any experience with this process in some Yes, so thank you for this question. Indeed, that uh, for certain standardization requests, such as the batteries in this case, the uh, assessment procedure is basically done by the desk officer. We have this experience in the past, uh, or I can mention multiple, but we had also for the general product safety, it was also going directly through the desk officer, which today actually I believe that there is a HAS consultant who is taking care of it, but we do have the experience uh, with such a, such a system. Okay, thank you, Nishi. Okay, uh, I would like to thank, uh, of course, all the speakers, but also you, all the attendees that joined us today for the many questions. We do reala realize that there are still questions that uh, are unreplied in the list, but uh, it would take us too long to uh, include them all during this presentation. So as promised, the Q&A report will be made available. You will be uh, informed about that. Uh, on the last slide here, I would just, of course, like to thank the speakers, and you will be provided with this presentation later on. So you have their contact details should you have any future questions. So thank you very much, everybody here in the room. Thank you very much, everybody in the digital room. And uh, see you hopefully next time on one of our future events. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.